Yeah, friends, you know we kicking it in the den. This den lends itself to the imagination. It is a den of imagination, if you will. And I shall. And this is my pal. You all know this dude, this gizmo. Yeah, he's so smart. I said, hey, will you come be the creature in my feature? And he jumped up and said, yes, I know what that means. I will be the creature in your feature. So we've done a lot of filming in the den, um, but this one in particular is for a friend who will remember many fond den memories of back yawn in the yonder days. So is that said properly? Back in the yawn, <laughs> the yawn days. So I'm wearing this for her. Had to dig through the basement for sure to pull out this gem. Alice in Wonderland. Oh yes, sending it sending it way back and it is um you know a little a little worse for the wear it's it's seen some wear and tear and some better days um had to cut the bottom off of it because it was all stained but it has remained it hath remained with me um and that's pretty nifty oh my gosh i feel like this should be my backdrop but i don't have it would just like be so right if it was but I don't have the energy or the fortitude or the attitude to make it so. If I could just hold it here the whole time, it really just seems so fitting to where I'm sitting. Maybe I could make it work. Probably not, but we could try a little experiment. It just seems, just seems kind of right. That would be too dangerous, right? That would be, that would be nuts. But like that. Um, you know, not really helping. But like that. At this point, this is just ridiculous. This is just me being ridiculous. As you are seeing. And hopefully laughing at. Because, you know, that's just me sometimes. I just get in that zone where I'm like, oh, this looks good. Let's do a totally unnecessary thing with it. Okay, we're back. That was an attack of my brain being insane, saying, I need a new backdrop to fit more with the Alice in Wonderland thing I mentioned before. <laughs> so who's keeping score, really? Um, so I had a good long conversation with this friend. I mentioned in the poem um, her nickname her aka her alias um from way back in the dailyus <laughs> just made that up her alias from way back in the dailyus uh er karune which means i keep wanting to switch back into my countess accent which means uh it means sea witch and only she knows that that is meant as the deepest a uh, compliment, not at all an insult, um, because she was in, and I've done poems about debut theater, and I grew up there, and we grew up in there together, and uh, <laughs> done poems about how that changed my life and her life and everyone's life who was in it, but our director for many years told me, we will never do The Little Mermaid, and I was like, please do The Little Mermaid, please, please, and she was like, we will never take on that show. It's too difficult. It won't happen. The show that they did after I left, I bet you can guess it. It was The Little Mermaid. <laughs> and I was so hurt. I was so mad not to be in that. I mean, I got to do Gulliver's Travels as my last show. And hey, who doesn't love a Lilliputian, right? I mean, who doesn't? We all love them. We all love the Lilli the people of Lilliput. But <laughs> I wanted to go under the sea, damn it. <laughs> so dag nabbit. 
so I missed out on that. Did not get to go under the sea. Poor me. But she did, and she was the sea witch. So our little posse in high school, uh, we were super nerdy like this, and we started little journals that we kept of our adventures together. And one of our friends in this four-person posse that we were pretty much like inseparable had a Tolkien elvish dictionary, naturally. And I've told you guys this before, but it's more important to this one than any of the other times I've mentioned it because this is for one of the posse people. And um, we anointed each other in a ceremonious way with these elfish names. And my elfish name was... Rea Stuvare, which I have tattooed in Elvish on the side of my skull in white. It's probably fading by now. Um, but it means she will start today. And it was something, I've mentioned this, that I used to write in magic marker or permanent marker on my hand every day. Start today. It was like my, come on, self, that thing I'm still trying to figure out. Get myself to go. And uh, my mom was always like, you'll get ink poisoning. Don't, you need to stop doing that. Don't you hate it when your mom's right? So I got mild ink poisoning. I mean, it wasn't like horrible, but I started to get a little bit of an infection in my hand. <laughs> so that demanded that I stop doing that. Now I have it tattooed, tattooed on my head, on my skull. But um, anyway, yeah, she was Ear Karune, the sea witch and Damn, was she good in that play, and her costume just went on for days with the tentacles. Oh, my goodness. And I had a little bit of resentical. <laughs> a little bit of resentical for not being able to be in The Little Mermaid, but it's okay. It's okay. Can't have it made all the time. Can't have it made all the time. But um, she's helped me through some of the most difficult feelings I've ever felt, and let me tell you, they've gotten pretty difficult at times. And... She just always finds me when I need to be found and says things that are so profound. And then it's just like, it's nothing. I'm whatever. I don't, uh, she like never takes credit for anything is easily one of the strongest people I know. And just like shows me love. It's crazy. Like some people, you know, they'll show up with it sometimes other times it's harder to find. Um, she's always there with it. Like, I know it's there. And she's one of my only friends who consistently checks on me. Like, throughout the pandemic, throughout our 20 plus many, many some odd years of knowing one another. Checks on me. And says, how you doing? Where are you at? What's up with that? <laughs> what do you want? What, what's going on, you know? Where where is your head? Um, so that means a lot. And I will bring you this poem about her now. My sweet LaRue. You know who you are, my sweet, sweet LaRue. Got this cutie pie getting all sleepy. It's like his bedtime story. So here we go, guts and glory. Um, I called it Theater Games and Elvish Names. We're not the same, but we are two stars who have come so far. She lovingly empathizes with me over a recent trespass that has me tripping over myself on every path, one that I can't seem to grasp the solution to. She gives her point of view in such a soothing way, saying, it's not gonna become an unpainted experience. You will not wipe it away from your brain, but you can perhaps choose a new frame for it. It's like she's sitting with me on one of our many lunch hour journeys in high school, her getting straight A's and me feeling like a struggling fool. She always seems to keep her cool even when things are practically consumed by chaos. She always leads me back to a path even when it's completely hidden and I'm way off. She knows, but telling me, and I'm way off. I don't know what I was trying to say here. I hate when I misspell things. <gasps> even when I'm way off. 
She knows. Telling me not to be hard on myself is like telling... Ah, I was voice to texting. It's hard, folks. It's hard, friends. I was walking through the woods voice to texting. Wouldn't recommend it. You'll confuse yourself. <laughs> she knows that telling me not to be hard on myself is like telling a moth not to go towards the flame. She knows that telling me not to be hard on myself is like telling a moth not to go towards the flame. She has come to know that when I'm in pain, I'm the first one I go after, lashing out and feeling scattered. She notoriously gathers up the pieces of me and helps to arrange them so carefully. I tell her that the disparity between who I thought I could be by now and who I am is something I didn't plan for and something I'm ashamed of. She meets my thoughts with love, as she always does. She addresses my words earnestly, not with trite surface fluff. Well, Teal, she says, revealing me to myself. It's not lunch table stuff. You know that I don't have to tell you that the problems have gotten way more tough since the days of being excluded from the cool kids club. But doing plays to substitute whatever we thought constituted actual difficulties. We were generally able to face those things and bring a sense of humor to it. And all of a sudden, we're in our thirties. We're workers. We're consumers. We're in the thick of it. I know you're sick of it. It happened quick, but you've got to pick a door that goes somewhere you want to see. I'm sure there's got to be a happier balance. You're not a loser. You're a bottomless well of talents. You're hurting. That's evident, but you can't be sedentary. That's scary. There's got to be a way for you to still be teal to carry your whole self to the next step with all the imagination and glimmer, but to be adept with a little more armor. She's always been smarter than me, and I don't say that to be mean to myself, but she really does hold a wealth of intelligence. The way she maneuvers her own intense challenges and thrives is evidence of her amazing mind and drive. She's revived me many times when I thought I was completely and totally empty. She presents me with so many angles I can view this life from when I'm struck dumb and feel totally tangled in it all. I used to call her with a kind of code. She lived just up the road from me, three houses up, and she showed me such kindness, helping me finesse math and science homework, which to me always looked like a mess of alien language on paper. But our nighttime capers were secretive and catered to the fact that her very traditional strict parents expected her homework packed up tidy and her lights to be out nightly by 9.30 exactly. I had to move stealthily through the neighborhood darkness and get to the window slyly and swift, lest I cause a rift in her family or get her grounded. I was confounded how a straight-A student who always treated matters of school and achievement as most prudent was always treated as somewhat impudent, as though she was some troublemaker, hell-bent on flunking out. She walked the route of impressive laurels and glimmering morals, but I still had to sneak to tap on her window well to enter the portal of her reliably comforting room. This was long before texts and tweets, and Zoom. And we faced the impending doom of her parents right upstairs so that we could laugh and cry and share. She cared for me in a way I've rarely felt in this existence. Others tend to put up a wall of resistance when the waterworks really get rolling, but she was always there, doling out advice and listening as only one who truly values your role in their life does. I got a buzz of excitement every time we pulled off our evening homework and soul work sessions without the incident of some parental fury. We would hear a creak or a shuffle upstairs and I would scurry back out the window into the night. She is a person of considerable height and one thing that always set right all the sadness and trouble in my life is the way she'd hug me and envelop me in this bubble of lovely, almost motherly protection. 
my shoulders came up to her midsection, and not in a vulgar way, but I have to say that a part of it was how I fit just so in her bosom. It's not meant to be weird, but I'm telling you that every time I was overcome by the sense, every time I was overcome by the sense that I was needed and loved and seen. My Iar Karune, she is never harsh or selfish or mean or any of those things that humans generally can't seem to avoid all the time. But she finds a way, even when she's having a horrible day, to be bright and exceptionally kind. I tell her I find it astonishing that in a 24-year friendship, I've never seen her be rude, even when she's going through terrible difficulties. Every time I see her, she finds a way to be upbeat and defeat the dark clouds somehow. She says, wow, thanks for pointing that out. I guess I do present that. I don't know how I manage to. Can't quite pin it. I guess people have their own limits and their own ways. I would say, I just prefer to be comfortable and happy. So I strive very hard to achieve that however I can, whatever it takes. And man, it really takes a lot of effort sometimes. But effort that's worth it if I can elevate the bullshit to something a bit more enjoyable. Gosh, the nostalgia pulls at my heart as she speaks. She continues, I get it though, Teal, you know? My ass isn't what it used to be. My friendships aren't what they used to be. But I guess my secret sauce is that I can pretty confidently say I can pull some joy from every day. From whatever I have to face, I can seek some sweet spot, some taste of the joy in it all. I audibly bawl a few times while we're talking. I wish I was walking the three houses up to sit with her. How do decades blur so rapidly? I tell her how much it hurts to seek words from friends and find people just pretending it's fine, riding that surface, speaking vapidly. She laughs affably, giving the gentle reminder that those stale reactions have always bothered me. It's not new. It just gives me the blues a little more noticeably. I suddenly remember vividly some of the unbearably, insipidly vacuous types we did indeed have to wipe from our mental slates throughout the years. Then my mind gears go back to what she said at the start of our talk about how something painful will not become an unpainted experience. It isn't chalk that washes away when it rains. But we can regain our footing without putting those paintings in the fire. I tell her about my desires to do something other than waitressing, to feel worthy and productive, but the search feels depressing. It's like she gives me her blessing to feel what I'm feeling without this pressure I force on myself to hurry up in revealing the antidote. Teal, she reminds me, you wrote a dang poem every day for the last 300 some odd crazy number of days. Dig down and give yourself a little praise. She relates all these painful changes to her own life shifts. She had to grit her teeth and work so hard to make a living in New York City bars. She became a cocktail creating star, even appearing on TV with Nick Lachey. Now that's mixology sway. And you cannot just play around if you want to stay in NYC. That's profound determination, if you ask me. She tells me how she felt so confident on this path, and the momentum of it felt nearly certain. I always thought I'd be a relatively outside-the-lines person, she recalls. I had a moment going to a kind of gross bar and looking around, like, really looking, and thinking, why do people want to be here at all? It's so sweaty. I felt heavy. Why are they paying for these pricey drinks, I wondered. What are they thinking? I remember blinking, being like, wow, I've made a career in these places. Now it seems like kind of a waste. But I replaced that doubt by just shifting the route a bit. Now I sell the products to make the drinks, but in a way that I think is more fulfilling. I travel. I'm not just in the bar watching the drinks spilling as people unravel their sensibilities. I bring me to the equation. 
I get benefits. I can take some vacations. It's not perfect, but the crazy ride of it was worth it. Just because it isn't your ideal doesn't mean it has to be bad. You don't have to constantly be sad about your former self. You can just be stoked to get to know your current self, to accept them for all that they've felt and the changes they've inevitably made due to life changing and that soaking through. Everything, she says, is true. I've been kicked around a bit, but I grew from it. I tell her I read these job postings and my hope just plummets. I used to see the summit of success as this thing that filled me with a sense of yes, yes I will. I see that summit still, but my will to get there has diminished. She scolds me only slightly saying, come on, you're teal. As if you're just finished being fabulous. I'm glad she keeps tabs on things I try to hide about myself or present as dried up or drab. I tell her that I felt myself slipping away in pandemic, so I grabbed on and I dug in deep and found parts of myself cowering or intentionally asleep, and I woke them up, pulled them out of their self-pity heap, and steeped in the real me until I was once again saturated fully. I tell her I became more me than I have been in a while, that I think it's vile so many have had to seemingly dilute themselves so that this current reality is something they can tolerate. Well, yes, she says, I get it. You've become teal concentrate. But see, that just means you have to generate defenses that are thicker because you are so much. So you. And that's not a bad thing. But the self-protection is something I think you must do. I'm glad you retrieved those pieces. If you couldn't get them back, just imagine that level of forlorn. If you feel like you've lost your unicorn horn or whatever it is, it's there. Do not despair, Teal. I'm here to tell you that it's there. Maintain your instinct to feel and to share. It's hard to care, but don't lose that. Time is a flat circle and it's a bouncing ball. You feel it all, Teal. And what there is to feel out there has become more real and certainly more intense. Don't let that prevent you from forging ahead or force you to give up on how much you can grow. You're being cruel to yourself and you know it. You're one of the hardest working people I know. You know how to show up and work, but you just don't want to be pushed around by jerks or give up a chunk of your soul again for it. Don't stash your fears about it in a pit in your gut. Yeah, it may feel like a big ass rut and getting out may be a difficult test. And you know, if a person is depressed, digging around in a job for answers maybe isn't going to provide that lift. But sometimes a reason to get dressed can be kind of a gift. I tell her it's hard to shift my thoughts from the fact that Robots read resumes now and how I never thought I'd get stuck at the last job for half for almost a decade, but I did. And I read the things that keep the world turning and feel a yearning for a better world and finding my place in it fills me with doubts. Well, she holds that mirror up to me again saying, that's a lot of what about isms that just won't take you anywhere. The longer you stare at that dread, that labyrinth in your head that says, all my biggest fears are, be are possible, <laughs> that routine will always pull you downward. Write yourself into a new scene, Teal, a scene that moves forward. You've sure been dealt your share of the unfair shit. That's valid and it's relevant. But you haven't ended up anywhere by accident. You always say the thing you're going after is not the thing you've got, but isn't it? People show up to see you perform. Young people swarm you to listen to your views on your craft. Ask yourself. Ask yourself if fame and wealth is actually the end game that helps you feel worthy or if Despite the very real swervy parts of the road you're on, 
that road is where you belong because you've held on to who you are all along. And despite your bank account context, you, your bank account contents, you are a star. Once again, she pushes the door that I've been barricading myself behind, ajar just enough for me to see how far both of us have truly come. And she's right. I'm not done. I spun myself dizzy, maybe, and cry like a baby that I can't see where I'm going because that dizzy feeling keeps slowing me down. But the sound of her voice helps me make a different choice. And suddenly, that bit of joy she mentioned is found. Woo! Soaking my face with that one. Soaking my dang face. Okay. So, wow. Mm. I read the back of this shirt, and I just have to say, it's just a funny, funny little corp, little cork, corp, little thing about our past and our history as friends. We grew up in the same neighborhood and I got into this theater company that we were both in first. And then when I found out she was joining, I was so mad and I was so mean to her. I was so mean. I was a little bitch. <laughs> I would just stand at the bus stop and not talk to her. Cause I was like, there's only room for one famous actress in this neighborhood. It was so bad. It was not good. I look back at that behavior and I'm like, oh, oh, help me. I need a behavior savior. Someone spanked me on my bottom. But I did get spanked on my bottom by the fact, sorry, so much snot. Sorry, LaRue. It's because of you. It's because of my deep love for you. But uh, I did get smacked on my bottom by the knowledge the full circle of the fact that you became one of the most important people in my whole life. And I don't know what I would do without you, you know? And so I was just being a little brat and I was like, only one star per neighborhood. <laughs> and we did, and then, but then I finally accepted like, okay. And we got into the same troop, the same team in the company and um, started working together. We got, Actually, I did my poem about Dracula and we got put together as set dressing and just became the dearest, dearest of friends. And that's when the trend started of tap, tap, it's me. <laughs> Let me in so I can tell you all the things in my heart. <laughs> and if, if this 365 days of poetry is any proof, there's a lot in my heart at any given time. So she um, saved me over and over again and helped me figure out how to do math. And I can't even tell you what a task that is because I don't get math. Um, and we did like a neighborhood production of uh, The Secret Garden together and she'll never let me live it down. And she, as she should not, she should never let me live it down. <laughs> that, uh, oh, such a clown sometimes. I had to be merry and we got in this huge fight and I don't even remember like all the bullet points made in the fight, but um, I was just like, you're dickin', I'm Mary, that's it. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so insistent on being Mary. It's scary how much I needed that, um, I don't know. Um, acknowledgement or whatever you want to call it. I needed, I needed that boost. I needed to be Mary. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, and you know, all of like, I think seven neighbors came to see our eloquent, well-performed, very relevant production of the secret garden. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my goodness. So just one of the dearest, dearest friendships I will ever have. I, and I stumbled a lot. Sorry. Sorry, Iar Karune. I was walking through the woods trying to multitask, trying to get that written. And you always think, yeah, you hear me. You hear me, phone robot. I'm voice to texting my emotions to you. Way off. That part I was trying to say, which is really a great line. She knows that telling me not to be hard on myself is like telling them off not to go towards the flame. I wrote, 
She knows, but telling me what to be hard on myself is like telling them off not to go towards the flame. It's like telling them off not to go. Telling them off. So funny. So little surprise here for you. Dug this out of the basement as well. Made it with my full-blooded fairy friend. Um, when we did our own little version of Alice in Wonderland costumes in Hollywood. And this was... <laughs> this was the Red Queen. <laughs> it's obscenely cool, is it not? I'm really afraid, actually, that there's spiders, like, hidden in these cards. Um, but, hey, it's okay. It's worth it for you. So, I pulled this out of my room as well, and I read all of our quotes on the back of this t-shirt, and I just think it's so nostalgic and sweet. Um, and I, I pulled this out, I thought it was appropriate, so in the play, obviously, I was Alice, and in debut, and she was the Red Queen. And she made her whole costume, and it was, like, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Like, so legit, way too legit to quit, and... Um, this is relevant in a lot of ways because I did, in fact, wear a lot of Wonder Bras in high school. <laughs> there was some definite Wonder Bra action happening. <laughs> so Alice in Wonder Bra is, uh, is pretty great. It's a pretty good throwback. Um, but on the back of this shirt is our quotes, and I'm going to leave you with yours because it is so relevant, I think, to the way you've guided me. Oh man, you just get me in those waterworks. The way you've guided me in our friendship and invited me to look at things from different angles and wrangled me back to myself when I tried to run away from myself time and time again and just been a true, true, true friend. And the quote that you picked for the Red Queen, I just think screams... Laru, it screams you. It's just proof um, of how absolutely amazing I think you are and such a star and I could never fit it into a poem. That sucker was, um, I think, nine pages long and it's just not, it's not enough. <laughs> um, but you are the stuff of legends, my friend, and I, your strength is beyond any scope that I've ever seen and I would go to any length for you because you are a queen so the quote you chose the quote you chose was this speak French when you can't think of the English for a thing turn your toes when you walk and remember who you are Thanks for reminding me that I am a star, and so are you, and I love you through and through and through and through and through. Love you.